Ah! Hey crew, I've got the key to that 23 Dodge Durango SRT Hellcat. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first, let's check it out what looks on the inside and outside. Yes, the Durango Hellcat is back. After Dodge swearing they were only gonna offer it for the 21 model year, guess Dodge likes money. Up front, we find lots of functional ventilation, this hood scoop, heat extractors, you got your grill with a Hellcat logo, front air dam, and functional corner vents. Above that, we find LED headlights with LED turn signals. This one is painted in triple nickel with the low gloss stripes. Not my favorite color, but you know me, I like my bright colors. Getting my Demon 170 in purple, for goodness sakes. At the side, the Hellcat gets a set of 20 inch machined alloy wheels wrapped in your choice of all season or as this is equipped summer tires pirelli p0s 295 section front and rear within those wheels are brembo six piston brakes with red painted calipers up front four piston at the rear another hellcat badge there black gloss for the mirror caps stepping back to look at the profile which is Sort of pedestrian, isn't it, for a 710 horsepower SUV? I mean, you got the hood bulge, that's cool, but the back half of the Durango just doesn't do it for me. On the Hellcat, you do get a little bit of flair up at the roof spoiler. This accent piece here. LED taillight bar, like the regular Durango, goes across the back, and their LED turn signals within. This four badge down low signifies all wheel drive. Another Hellcat logo off to the right. Down low are two large chrome exhaust outlets. And the Durango Hellcat can tow up to 8,700 pounds with the towing pack. What do you think about the stripes? Are we into those? Okay, here's my question for you. Does the Durango Hellcat look crazy enough to have all the power that we know it does? Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up. And looking inside at this premium package equipped vehicle with the demonic red and black Laguna leather seating, contrast stitching, seat perforations, SRT logos, and second row captain's chairs with a console and second row seat heating. To get to the third row, pull this lever and then this strap. And hopefully your driver isn't too tall because then you couldn't lift this all the way up. You do have a nice wide access point to that third row where we find two individual seats for a total of a six seater configuration. And these seats do not slide. So this is their fixed position. And this is my knee room at six feet tall. Headroom is also pretty good. I can't really make it back to that headrest, but my head's not pressed against the roof uncomfortably. That gets the thumbs up from me. We also have cup holders on either side, but no USB ports to get out. Pull that strap again, once and twice. Taking a peek at the doors, injection molding is up high. We've got forged carbon fiber trim, like an Aston Martin, wow. Leather topping for your armrest, contrast stitching, hard plastics down low, Harman Kardon 19 speaker sound system with that premium package. There is a grab handle to make it easy to get in. Behind my own seat at six feet tall, I've got enough knee room, but once again, I can't slide the seat back for more. And this is all hard plastic, and this netted pocket is going to wear out quick. The foot pockets are large to slide my feet under. Thigh support is just sort of okay, though. Headroom is excellent. Head easily clears the roof. That gets the thumbs up from me. In the middle are air vents. Down low, we've got USB-A ports and an AC outlet. Up top is your third zone of climate control. And then with this console, we have two cup holders and just cavernous storage inside. So much of it, a DC and a USB-A port. You can also access this console from the third row. Air vents we find up top in both the second and third rows. Let's check out the front. Door closed noise. A little bit of a rattle there at the end. Smart keel sentry is for the front two doors. The front seats are heated and ventilated with the premium package, and they get additional lateral support, power adjustments for the front seats, SRT floor mats, aluminum supercharged tread plates, aluminum foot pedals. The front doors look similar to the back. We add two one-touch windows up front, not for all four, 
power adjusting, not power folding door mirrors, two position memory for the driver's seat. To release the tailgate, reach in here and hold that button momentarily. Tailgate itself is very slow. Come on, come on. All right, behind the third row, we've got 17 cubic feet of space and quite a bit of additional storage underneath the floor. To fold down this third row, lift up on the lever and lean the seat forward. It does go almost completely flat. To bring it back up, pull on the strap. Behind the second row, we find 43 cubic feet of space. And if you fold down the third and the second row, then you've got 85 cubic feet of space. The tailgate's power close button is here off to the side. And I'm not waiting for that. Power operated sunroof with the premium package. Wish it was panoramic though. Hopping in the driver's seat. Throwing it in accessory mode. Drivers find a heated leather wrapped steering wheel, very thick in the hands and the paddles look amazing from here, but then you get your hands back there and you go, oh, it's, it's just this part. These are like media controls. Digital instrument cluster below the tachometer. Then we've got an analog speedo off to the left, fuel and temp meter off to the right, all in red, cause red says power. No head up display, stitched leather, on the dashboard with the premium package, more forged carbon fiber accenting there. And here is a 10 inch Uconnect 5 software infotainment system. It's reasonably responsive when it gets all warmed up and cozy. The layout is good, it's visually compelling, and it's got wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Beneath the screen are lots of physical controls and dials. I'm happy to see those. Four USB ports, two way 2C, wireless smartphone charging pad, two cup holders, key slot, under the leather top console, we've got an upper and a lower level of storage. Visibility is pretty good, and you can fold down any of the headrests you aren't using. There are some blind spots, but we've got standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic. Yes, this cabin is based on a $40,000 SUV that's been gussied up to 106 grand. So you're gonna find some hard plastics in places, but all the special bits, the forged carbon fiber, the two tones of leather that extend up onto the dashboard makes it feel pretty cool. I'm ready, let's take the Durango Hellcat for a drive. All right, let's fire it up. Say yes to that noise. Well, crew, we're doing something different today. I have brought in the Driven Diary style additional camera angle just to try this out. If you guys like this during the video, please let me know in the comments. If you don't like it, also please let me know in the comments. So, we've got the Durango Hellcat here. It's fired on. And to launch our drive mode, I said launch because I was looking at the word launch. We're not launching right now. We're pulling up our drive modes. So we've got track, sport, auto, snow, tow, custom. We're gonna start out in auto, but we're not gonna start out in eco. We're just gonna go regular auto. Then pull back on the gear selector to go into reverse. That brings up a screen filling, but very low resolution camera. They've been using this same camera, I swear, in FCA or now Stellantis vehicles for like 10 years. Why not upgrade that? That's not that expensive to change. It does have trajectory lines, that's good. No surround view camera, of course. No front facing camera, no wheel shots, none of that. Down into drive. And away we go. Kicking things off with the world famous horn test. Yes, just a solid attention getting horn. If the Hemi V8 doesn't do that for you. Turn signal sound. Pretty loud, not my favorite. powertrain in this Durango SRT Hellcat. You know what we're working with. It's a 6.2 liter supercharged V8 that makes 710 horsepower in this application and 645 pound-feet of torque. That is routed through an eight-speed torque converter automatic and sending power to all four tires via a permanent all-wheel drive system. Now, that's a lot of power. And in auto mode, the throttle response is touchy enough that you could easily just give it a little too much and be going very quickly. That's why I actually prefer to drive the Durango Hellcat in auto with 
eco-selected because that dulls the throttle response so that you never accidentally go too fast. But keep in mind, with all that power always at your disposal, at any point in time, you can push your foot harder on the throttle and quickly get up to speed. So here's an example. Gently rolling on, power building smoothly. Oh, I need to make a gap. And it comes in with appreciable power and noise. This is not a frightening vehicle to drive. It might be frightening to other people hearing it, but it's certainly not scary to drive. You can meander, you can enjoy these comfortable seats, so well padded, extra supportive, enough adjustability to them. I could found a good drive, I could find a good driving position for myself. The ride with these adaptive dampers is it's a little bouncy even in the softest setting the street setting of the dampers but not to a point of outright annoyance it's just a little tedious if some days you're trying to commute and you don't necessarily want to feel everything going on with the road surface well kind of too bad you're getting it in the Durango Hellcat now we're going to try out the turning radius wheel fully cranked That's actually incredible. <laughs> Having no rear wheel steering system and it being a giant three row SUV to turn around that tightly, that, that may have been so far the most shocking thing about the Durango Hellcat is how good that turning radius is. Make something this big easy to maneuver. And so back to the ride quality for a second. Yeah, you're bouncing around a bunch. It does distill the harsh impacts sufficiently so that the dampening is good, but the feeling of a sport-tuned SUV is ever-present. And if that's not something you want every single day if you're daily driving this, you may want to look elsewhere. If you can tolerate it, which I think the vast majority of people even looking at something like this would, it's all good. Now, how about launch control? Now I get to actually say it because it's time. So I've got my race box set up here and yes, there is a launch control zero to 60 timer built into the vehicle, but we're gonna rely on this instead. I'm gonna go into the sport drive mode and then hitting the launch button will allow me to apply full braking and full throttle. I then release the brake and we see what this 710 horsepower SUV can do. Oh my, 3.76 seconds to 60 on a slight uphill with this, with three rows of seating. Good Lord. <laughs> ah, off the line, the all wheel drive grip gets this power down in ways that the rear drive Hellcats just cannot. And that alone is amazing. But then you factor in the noise, the theater of this powertrain. And you can't help but giggle. You cannot help it if you have any funny bone in your body. then there's just pure joy emanating from you as the driver. And then when you need to come to a stop, the brake pedal is quite easy to modulate. You can smoothly come up to that stoplight before you tear into it again. <laughs> Straight line speed, it's tenacious. The sound of the Hemi V8 mixing with the supercharger wine, which I now want to eke out a little more. So let's go to manual mode and utilize these disappointingly diminutive paddles. Where I find uh, acceptably quick shifts. Eight 
and the ability to go all the way out to Redline. I do love that. And just isolate that supercharger whine between like four to 5,000 RPM. Right there. What a melody. <laughs> oh, I love this thing. Now I'm about ready to give this big girl some real exercise with a braking and handling test. Before that, let's go into the track drive mode, make everything as aggressive as possible. We'll carry some speed into this curve and clamp down hard on these Brembos. Here it goes. Pedal wasn't inspiring confidence, but we did stop. Good feedback through the wheel. Chunky tires providing grip here. And the limited slip differential gets the power to the ground. Let's go for round two. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Some very good and some things that definitely need improvement. For one, the brakes. The feel of that pedal was absolute mush. And that is terrifying when you're wielding 5,300 pounds coming quickly to a stop before a corner. You need confidence from the brakes. And while we did have decent stopping power from the six piston Brembos up front, the four piston in the rear, it just didn't feel that through the brake pedal. I was, however, very impressed with how this SUV controlled its body through the corner. The adaptive dampers flattened it and the giant sway bars kept it from leaning heavily in the curve with the grip from the tires and then that limited slip differential getting the power down through the corner and a measure of feedback through the wheel. I want to be clear about that. It's not brimming with communication, but it does have just enough resistance that communicates the grip from the tires, which with the all-wheel drive system was quite a bit. So more impressed than not, I just think those brakes need to be tuned up. And since we find ourselves meandering on the highway, let's take it out of track, go into auto once more and eco, and listen for the NVH level at highway speeds. Okay, so definitely getting some wind noise in this cabin. Depending on the road surface, more tire noise than not. And if you have to apply throttle at any level, then you're hearing that Hemi V8. None of this is unbearable by any stretch of the imagination. But if you're coming in and seeing $100,000 for this vehicle as tested, and thinking, oh, I'm gonna get a luxury product. That's not it. You are getting a mainstream SUV and mainstream SUV noises inside the cabin. We also have adaptive cruise control with steering assistance, by which I mean really just a lane keep feature. So just to try this out, kind of let it float over and it does correct us and then center in the lane pretty well. Except for there. <laughs> As I said, not a hands-free feature. It will get you back in the lane if you are deviating, and these are nice features to have on a longer road trip. It's about time now for my miles per hour word of the day, which for the 23 Dodge Durango SRT Hellcat is inconspicuous, meaning not attracting attention. Yes, this vehicle can attract attention. If you are putting your foot down everywhere you go, if you're getting it with the stripes, people are gonna know something's up. But if you get it without the stripes, and if you're driving this more modestly, day in and day out, short of the Hemi V8 noise, if people are not listening for supercharger wine, if they don't know what they're looking for, this might just be 
a fancier Durango. It might just be the RT version. It doesn't have to be the Hellcat. And so, to most passers-by, this is just a family 3.0 SUV. But you know better. You know it's got 710 horsepower and can put a smile on your face at any point in time. And that's wonderful knowledge. Before we hop into pricing and competition, let's talk about top speed and fuel economy. The top speed of the Durango Hellcat is 180 miles per hour, and I believe that makes this tied with the Alpina XB7 as the fastest three-row SUV you can buy. The fuel economy is appropriately abysmal given that power and that top speed. It's 12 MPG in the city, 17 on the highway, and just 13 combined. The starting price is just a hair under $93,000, and this vehicle as tested with the premium package, with the stripes, with the paint job, and a couple other bits, is around 106 grand. Now the competitive discussion is a little bizarre because there's not a direct high performance three row unibody SUV. We have some vehicles that kind of sort of compete. So let's think about the BMW X7 M60i, which starts at $104,000, makes 523 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.3 seconds, has a top speed of 155 miles per hour, and fuel economy of 18 combined. There's the Mercedes-Benz GLS 580, which starts at $106,000, makes 483 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.7 seconds, has a top speed of 155 miles per hour, fuel economy of 18 combined. And then there's the Cadillac Escalade V. That is a body on frame SUV. It makes, it starts at $152,000. It makes 682 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.5 seconds, has a top speed of 124 miles per hour, and equally abysmal fuel economy as the Durango Hellcat, meaning 13 combined MPG. If money was not really an object, I'd probably go get that Cadillac Escalade V. It's got even more space. I think it looks awesome. It sounds ludicrous. The overrun in that is a fireworks display. It's so much fun to drive. And if you've got Escalade V money, then you almost certainly have an additional sports car that's going to be better to drive in a canyon environment. You're not trying to do it all in one vehicle. If you don't have Escalade V money though, if $100,000 is kind of a stretch, but you're willing to do it, then it's gonna be the Durango Hellcat for me because while the X7 M60i could give this a run for its money in terms of cornering capability, it's just not the same laugh out loud fun to drive while having actually doesn't have the same interior space as well. The Durango Hellcat can tow more and it's got more space for third row passengers. I don't love how this vehicle looks from every angle. The brake pedal, as I said, is kind of squishy when you're really getting on it and uh, the interior cheapness can be found, but you're getting so much for the money and there's just nothing like this that this is the big kid choice for me. Maybe the adult would get the X7, but the big kid, which is where I base all of my purchase decisions, loves the Durango Hellcat. I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV drive review. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel. Let me know which you guys would pick. Would you get the Durango Hellcat? Would you go X7 M60i? Would you get Escalade V? Or would you go for the GLS 580? Now let's pop it into sports and I will see you guys again next time. Yeehaw!